Do we need to do that? No, oh, okay. you're now being recorded, so you know that. And when I do that and I get rid of this little user interface, pop that out of the way, I do as best I can a formal introduction. That formal introduction is welcome to First Friday. We're delighted to have our speakers today from our, our uh, nearby music therapy department. And one of our goals this semester is to have an interdisciplinary kind of presentation. So what we're going to try and do is uh, have the opportunity for some of my nursing colleagues. I have some doctoral students that are here. I have some co colleagues who are faculty who are here. It looks like we have some music therapy students and staff from the Rebecca Center here. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I'm going to waste a little time and get John and Mike set up. John Carpenti is the director and founder, I believe, of the Rebecca Center at Moy College. And I'm going to let him do a better self-introduction rather than me mess it up. Mike Kelleher and, uh, is on the staff as a therapist in the Rebecca Center. The beauty of having these guys come it, uh, is that we are currently involved in a project that's an interprofessional project. We're looking at child development, child, uh, um, child and parent interaction, that sort of aspect of the study and we are partnering with this this project that if you come to the research day next Wednesday, Fran, Fran Bononieri will be co-presenting with me on the beginning data that we've collected. So I'm not going to do a whole lot more other than Mike and John. I'm going to turn it over to them. They're going to see how, how swift I am to get rid of this. I'm going to minimize that. I'm going to maximize you. <coughs> And I'm going to get John started. John, you're going to be full screen. And there you go. You're on. John and Mike. And just let that endpoint thing will go away. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, folks. And Brian, thanks for, for having us. We're, we're always trying to figure out ways that we collaborate with other performers. And so I think this is a great launching to, the, to our first. This is the, the, the study that Ronnie alluded to. We've been doing this. For three, four years, but we actually are doing it. We're now. actually doing it now. We're actually doing it now. Um, so it's great to be here, and this is a great room. I noticed at the moment I walked in, the sound you don't hear reverb. It's just, it's a great. Room. You don't He's jealous. He's <laughs> jealous, Kylie. You would think we should have this in music, but that's another presentation. <laughs> so, um, Bonnie asked Mike and I to come and talk about some of the work that's going on at the Rebecca Center. So we, we plan on giving you a little history and some uh, background of the of this one here. Some history and some background of the center. Um, general definition of what music therapy is and what it's not. <clears throat> how we apply it clinically in our programs. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about our programs and then how that ventures off into research and some of the current things that we're doing and some of the published stuff that is already done and stuff that's already in progress. So if you have any questions anytime, please, or suggestions or comments, it's very informal. You just chime in. And if you need to leave, because I know that <laughs> there's stuff going on that's every minute of the day, but we understand, correct? Um, okay. So I, I founded the Rebecca Center, I guess, uh, uh, 2000. I found, I found it in the basement of a church. It's the only place that would have me. And I started <laughs> off with, uh, with one kid. I, before that, I just finished my master's degree at New York University, and I was working on an HIV AIDS unit at, um, at uh, Terrence Connell Cook Healthcare Center in Manhattan, in Harlem. And uh, I always wanted to create a clinic. So when I was a student at NYU, I had the privilege of being at their Norton Robbins Center. And as a student, you think that there are many places like this. Right? It's, it's a controlled environment. They just offer music therapy services and training. Um, but actually, it's only one in the country. And so leaving there, I wanted to see if I could start something up that, that, would, be, that, that would be in a similar model <clears throat> uh, and also uh, similar types of services. So I had left my job at Carmel Cook a year before being invested uh, to, to try this. So I started off with one client, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew. Before I knew it, I had two, three days full, but it was just me. So I came to Malloy. I was I got I received my bachelor's from Malloy. So I came to Malloy. I said, Hey, would you want to? I'm giving you the short version. Would you want to clinic here? We could we could supplement the training you know, of the student uh, classroom with an on-site clinic. And they said, Great. 
We were a 501c3 at the time. I had a board of directors, and we thought this was a great idea. So at that time, we moved in about 2002, right after 9-11. Um, we were still a separate entity from the lawyers, paying rent and insurance, but we were on campus. <clears throat> and then in 2009 or 8, uh, I started bringing in other uh, staff. Jill was one of the first folks. She was a, All the staff are former students from here, so they've all trained at the Rebecca Center. So we kind of you know, indoctrinate them in what we think is right, and then we bring them on board. Um, but Jill was one of the first clinicians uh, outside of myself to join the team. And then we had interns at Fieldwork students and the center grew. We only had one treatment room. And uh, Valerie Collins was here at the time and we spoke, we spoke. And I think Mike McGovern just started working here. Is what Drew was pretty new. He just started, it was his first year here. So we had the initial ribbon cutting, it was nice. But as the center grew, because I was doing everything. I was doing the payroll and I was doing the pay everything. And, and, and I didn't want to do that anymore. And so, uh, and we needed a bigger space. And so our board agreed that the center would be fiscally sound if Malloy took it over. And I also wanted it to be set up where if I was to leave one day, it would be, be bigger than me. And, and um, so that's what happened. And Malloy took it over, I think in 08 or 09, right? And we moved down to the lower level of uh, Wilbur. And we have uh, three treatment rooms, an eval room, or kind of like an all-purpose room, right? And, and offices for the staff. And so since then, Malloy has been really supportive. It's been it's been great. Um, so we moved from being a pre pre predominantly clinical training site to now we're shifting more of our attention to research. We're going to talk about that as we move on to the presentation. Um, we serve about 50, 60 families a week. Is that uh, right? Um, Stephanie is our admin. She's really the nucleus of the center. You don't realize until she's not there one day. <laughs> Nothing gets, you know, it's just, you know, you can't, yeah, you just can't function. Um, but it's true. She is the nucleus of the center. Um, and so we probably see about, yeah, about 60, 60 families there. We have a waiting list of about 60, 70. 70 coming in. And we don't do any type of marketing except for word of mouth. It just shows the, uh, the greatness of the staff. Because as we got bigger and bigger, I started fading out clinically, and the staff really run the ship. And the interns, we have uh, two, uh, two interns here, Caitlin and Nadi, and a fieldwork student. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, two, two of our fieldwork students. Um, and they're just terrific. All of the students want to come to the center. Unfortunately, we don't have enough rooms for them. So we do choose the cream of the crop. And that's who these guys are. <laughs> oh, and Jan's a former intern now, a grad student. Sorry, Jan. <laughs> but the thing is, I'm so used to them, it's almost like he's just part of the group, you know? And you just, yeah, but it's true. It's true. Um, they really are the, the lifeline of the center. And you see when it's buzzing. You wouldn't even know that they're students because everyone is doing their thing. So, anyway, we'll get to that later. Primarily, our, 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 the population that we serve, our client group, is autism. Probably 80 to 90% of the, the families that come in have a child or, or adolescent, even adults, you know, diagnosed um, with ASD. We do a lot of presenting. We present our research internationally and domestically. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the work of that. We also do events. Every year we do a, usually clinical conferences, but this last last year we've been now moving our focus to neurodiversity. So, Dean, where's Dean? Uh, she's one of our senior clinicians as well. She initiated this uh, arts and diversity event last year. And almost 300 folks attended. We've merged with other community groups that had similar interests. And it was just an incredibly successful event. It looks like we're going to do this every year. She is also our editor in chief of our newsletter. <laughs> um, we, uh, as I said earlier, we, we, um, we train fieldwork students and interns, even observation students. So second year uh, undergrad students, what they're required to do is find a site and just observe. They don't really do hands-on, which was the end of the semester they might, but it prepares them for subsequent semesters where they do field experiences. So we probably have, combined with graduate and undergrad, uh, every semester could be between 10 and 20 students that come and observe and do their clinical hours that way. <clears throat> because we videotape each session that we have and we archive stuff, students don't have to be in the room. And because of HIPAA and confidentiality and also because we're dealing in dynamic relationships, we don't have the observations happening in the room. We can just revert them to the video tape and have a, ther a, a seasoned therapist there talk them through as they watch it. Um, 
Right. So basically, our, our, our mission consists of uh, doing clinical work, training, supervision, and research. Mm -hmm. This cutting. is our second ribbon cutting. Oh. So this is when Malloy took over this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that was 2010. Yeah, there you go. At that point, I was just getting my feet wet. I was a freshman undergrad. I was actually at that, mm -hmm. um, not knowing that one day I would be here. So, kind of cool right, Mike was a former intern also, and now he's a, a super staffer. So speaking on the mission a little bit, um, you know, what do we do exactly? We, we, as music therapists, and we'll talk about what music therapy system does, we use interactive music therapy, so we're always having kids play with us in some sort of way. We'll talk about that more. Um, to foster relatedness, engagement, and communication. So when we talk about autism, and again, we'll talk about that soon too, uh, we'll, we'll dive into it a bit more. We are looking at addressing some of the core features of autism. So what our mission really is to do is to help, through creativity, help foster relatedness and engagement and relationship with people. And we do that, as we just mentioned, in pretty much a fourfold way, clinical services, training, education, research, and publications. More come on that. And just to piggyback onto the mission, you see, um, these cognitive barriers, physical barriers, whatever gets in the way, we don't work on those behaviors. We just support those behaviors. Because our goal is to engage whoever the participant in active music experiences. So it doesn't matter, you know, if a kid can't sit down. It doesn't matter if, it, if an adult can't sit down. Whatever's in the way, we have to figure out how to support it and move them up the developmental ladder. And so everything is all about relationship and communication. We'll get more into that in the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we, we talked about uh, just, just a little bit about what autism is. It's also good to clarify what autism isn't. So we, as we have students come in, we really talk a little bit about what exactly is going on for a kid. So a lot of the times what we'll find in different approaches um, is that we are trying to address memory-based things in autism, which may not necessarily actually be the root cause of a lot of challenges. A lot of the times we're trying to promote a lot of, uh, you know, remember this, remember that, or using musical experiences to, to uh, just uh, remember things. But that's not necessarily what autism is really about. We're trying to address more the core features of the things that keep them out of social situations. So we're trying to promote interaction and playing with them through that way, not through rote memory sort of uh, activities. But we like to address those things through actual music making. And we work with, a, with, a, with a, a, autism does tend to have a kind of, we'll talk about uh, maybe some individual differences where we really care about what's happening for <laughs> people with autism. We're talking about hypo and hypo, hyper and hypo reactivity to different sensory stimuli. So music is a, is a multi-sensory stimuli, meaning that we can feel and hear and uh, not taste music, but mo a lot of other senses uh, to address some of the features that might be difficult for someone to be a part of a relationship. So this came from the DSM, but it's like 30 pages condensed into one slide. Uh, overall, I just kind of funnel it down to autism is a disorder of relating and communicating. Nowhere in the DSM does it say autism is a memory disorder. Nowhere in the DSM or even previous research does it say that cognition is part of autism. But for some reason, folks are, are treating kids with autism with memory-based interventions. So they're learning through rote, you know, learning words through rote, learning how to count through rote. Learning how to say hello through rope. But we're seeing now in current research that that doesn't generalize. When you learn through rote, it's, it's, it's very uh, stimulus response, right? You do this, you say hello uh, to Stephanie, I'm going to give you a cookie. Say hi, Stephanie. Oh, good saying hello, you get a cookie. But what is the kid actually learning? How do you get the cookie? Yeah, he doesn't understand how to say hello. Because when you say hello to someone who walks through the door, you have to have an affective type of experience, like, oh, I like Stephanie, I want to say hello, or I don't like Stephanie, I don't want to say hello. That's also relating and communicating. But it takes a lot of abstract and symbolic thinking. It doesn't work through behavioral models, and the research shows that. So we are the antithesis of working in a behavioral way. And so this is the, the latest, well, the latest DSM, I guess, 2014. Um, they removed a couple of things. And basically, it talks about social impairments. Uh, Restricted and repetitive behavior patterns, in other words, you know, lining up toys, not really using toys functionally. you just more interested in how things operate than the functionality of things. 
And this is new to the DSM where they finally address sensory issues. This was never in there before. Some kids come in that are hypersensitive, maybe the sound or, or, or vision or maybe pro proprioceptive input, hyper or hyper responsive. Then sometimes you have kids that have mixed reactivity. So just think how hard it must be for them to stay in a classroom and learn, right? But then again, what happens generally in classrooms is they're just attending to the behavior problem. We're going to get them to sit down. We're going to get them to do this. But the kid's nervous system isn't set up for that. And so what do they do? They get put in timeout. So what does he learn? How to get out of the classroom. <laughs> exactly, right? I think that paradigm shift is also where we'll be talking a little bit about today, where we're not necessarily seeing, uh, if you will, like stereotypical autistic behaviors as just purely behaviors, but there's an underlying meaning behind it. And we try to address that in how we make music with people and how we connect with people. So it's, 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 it's definitely turning its head right now in the autism world in terms of how we're approaching and treating kids with autism. Is that not necessarily, it's not happening because they're seeking attention or it's because some sort of defiant uh, behavior, but it's because of a, of a need that's actually happening beneath the surface that we need to understand better. Okay, so um, these are traditional approaches in autism, just a general thing. So behavioral approaches, there's a model called the applied behavioral, applied behavioral analysis way of uh, working with kids. This has been the gold standard probably since the 50s. It comes, comes out of learning theory from Skinner and Ivar Lovaz, who had a lab at UCLA. He worked in this way. Which interesting is that everything on this earth has evolved with technology and understanding, except one thing, how we work with kids with autism. Although the research shows differently, there are kids still being treated this way, because that's where the dollars are going right now. But we're not going to get into the politics of it. <laughs> um, so I would say probably 15 years since, you, you won't find a, a trial with just ABA probably in the last 15 years, but they're still using it. Right. So it's happening within, I would say, 10, 15 years, we're getting more uh, brain science is, is, is taking more of a role. And we're seeing now developmental ways of working. But developmental ways of working is working with a child based on typical child development. So that's baseline. This is what we're working with a child based on what typical kids are doing at age three, age four, et cetera, et cetera. The behavioral models are looking at isolated behaviors. They're not looking at the whole child, they're looking at changing behaviors. So you heard of the black box theory? We don't really care why it's going on, we just want to change it. We're looking, we're, take, we're taking a ground up approach, they're taking more of a top bottom approach. And now this, all the, 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 the autism, the rock stars in autism research, UCLA, Rutgers, Yale, <clears throat> what they're doing now is they're doing a hybrid way of working. They call it naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions. It doesn't even make sense, <laughs> but this is what they're calling it. And so it's getting a lot of legwork. In these um, uh, research reviews, we're looking at evidence-based practice, what's the, the, the best evidence for parents to, to look at. They're saying that this is. And so they're, deep, they're saying that developmental doesn't have enough evidence, but when you, when you look at what these articles are, because we did a, along with Dee when she was a student, we did an, in, oh, look at that. How do I make it smaller, though? I think double okay. touch it. Oh. Hit the yeah. escape over here, Mike. In any event, <laughs> <laughs> um, we found, and we're going to get more into this, that these naturalistic developmental behavioral studies were actually developmental. They were actually developed, the strategy of developmental. But there were some behavioral things in there. It was like more of a blender thing, but it was semantic. -y. We do these things already if you work in a developmental framework. <clears throat> um, and then, so we've had we we've been you know honored to work with some high level researchers in autism outside of music therapy, who are like minded, and they have worked you know with Connie Kasari is uh, she took over Lovaz's lab in UCLA. She's she's a big a big time player in autism research, and she said off the record, what we're doing is developmental. But if we write a grant saying we're doing it, we won't get the dollars. It's so sad that someone with that kind of power is doing things like this. So I would say that our approach, the Rebecca Center, probably falls between developmental and natu naturalistic developmental uh, behavioral. So when you look at them, when you really break it down, sorry, you touched it again. 
Um, they're really close to being the same. It's just, you know, what's in a name? Um, Okay. Oh, okay. So I broke this down into really some of the characteristics of each model. I'm not going to go through everything, but really here in developmental, we're looking at foundational capacities, where the ABA, the behavioral folks, are looking at foundational behaviors. So they might try to help a child with eye contact. We're going to we're going to reinforce these uh, eye contact behaviors. We are more interested about the things that you need in order to to be able to engage with eye contact, such as looking at Stephanie walking in and saying hello to her, right? So those foundational capacities are maybe like self-regulation, joint tension, focus, and then eye contact is, is kind of like a product of that. But we also know that if a kid doesn't look at you, it doesn't mean he's not social. It could mean that maybe he's visually overwhelmed. The beauty of music is I don't have to look at you to engage with you. We can still engage auditorily or through movement or whatnot. <clears throat> so these are some of the the contrasting differences here. And then as you look at here, this is the naturalistic, uh, the, the hybrid I mentioned. The application is basically developmental. The starting point of the interaction is based on the child's interests, just like here. So we follow their lead, you know, emotionally, so we can uh, provide some empathy, but also look at their interests. So if they like fixating on this phone because um, they can't really see the forest, but they see the trees and they're looking at this phone, I'm not going to take it away. It's my job to make this interactive. This is what they have a passion about. Now, I'm not going to let them play on it either, although that's what some of the behaviors think we do. We go, oh, the kids can do whatever they want. It's not true. But we have to enter into their world as opposed to trying to get them to enter into our world. That's the first phase of interaction in our way of working. All right? And then all these different things are embedded within the interaction. It's all done within the context of relationship. <clears throat> Um, you can go to the next slide, Mike. So now we're switching gears a little bit to now talk a little bit about music therapy. Uh, it's probably a term, I, I, I like going into this because a few years ago talking about music therapy to people that aren't music therapists, they'd be like, yeah, kind of, kind of heard of it. But I think in, we're kind of in a different crowd now in a different sort of stage and all of that where it's a little bit more well known. It's a little bit actually kind of publicized and there's a lot of media stuff on it. You've probably heard some of these like pretty positive stories about music therapy. Um, but going back, uh, it's, it's nice to like kind of think about where are the roots towards all this. And it does actually span back a few uh, centuries. If you go back, you can actually find music therapy or music as therapy or musical therapy. These different terms are actually used from like Plato and Aristotle. And, and that, that music has always been and seems to be, always will be a way for people to achieve some sort of wellness. And that's really what we care about as music therapists. So uh, music therapists really design music interventions and experiences to help people achieve some sort of health through goals. So we have standardized goals. It's a it's evidence-based practice at this point. Lots of research being done in music therapy through lots of different ways of doing music therapy. Today we'll talk specifically about how we go about doing it, but it looks different in everywhere you go. So there's music therapy in hospitals and school settings and prisons. Um, nursing homes, so it does span the whole age range in terms of life, and also spans all abilities, all capabilities, all challenges of life. Um, so we, the people that we see at the center are primarily with aut autism diagnosis or of the like neurodevelopmental disorders, but it, that, it doesn't stop there. Uh, there's, 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 there's lots of people that come through our doors every day that find music to be a meaningful experience that they can share with, with, a, with a credentialed music therapist. Uh, so what you might see in certain settings is what music therapy is and what music therapy isn't. Uh, there's some people that are still kind of being weeded out in terms of, well, although they weren't necessarily music therapists, they might be coming in for entertainment purposes, but they may not have uh, you know, music therapy goals behind what they're doing. So we, there's a lot of uh, stringent education that goes into becoming a music therapist, and we hold that title pretty close to our hearts. So uh, you do need a board certification to be a music therapist, and then to be practicing beyond that music psychotherapy, it's encouraged uh, to receive a master's degree so you can practice in that sort of frame set. So we might see some people that are doing music at a hospital or music at a senior living home who may not be music therapists, but uh, it definitely, definitely has its place in the world at this point. Some, sometimes, you know, you might see someone doing recreation, especially with the elderly. 
in nursing homes or even hospitals. There's nothing wrong. We're not saying anything wrong with that. We're just trying to find our place. So it's a, it is a little different. A lot of folks think, oh, we're going to teach uh, the client songs, so we're going to teach them how to play an instrument. That could be therapeutic, but that's not really what we do. We're working in music to provide experiences that are clinically directed. It all depends how, of, of whatever the needs and the, or, or the challenges and the strengths are of the, of the clients that we're working with. So it's very different. Education is more about an, an activity where what we're trying to do is, is provide an experience. Because <clears throat> in that experience, we believe that the relationship is the key thing. It becomes very dynamic. <clears throat> we'll get more into that. And those things that we mentioned that may not seem what music therapy is, uh, they may be just for us a means to another end. Just like how the different approaches, uh, we can talk about that a little bit more in detail, uh, we may do a behavioral intervention or a technique for the means of better connecting with the child in relationship. So it's not about isolating a behavior or, or extinguishing a behavior, but it's about maybe finding regulation for the child or providing safety in general. So we may have things that may look behavioral to some people's eye, but the approach is it's just how we wear our lens. It's, how, it's what we make meaning of what we're doing in the sessions and how we uh, monitor progress and goals. So how it looks at the Rebecca Center, you know, there are different definitions, even in our field, you know, worldwide. But we subscribe to Kenneth Brucher. He's a pretty well-known scholar in the field. <clears throat> and uh, so just to simplify, our task is, task is to provide music experiences to foster relationships. And the things that happen in, in those musical dynamics is where the therapy lies. You know, say, for, so for the kid with autism, it could be, wow, they're beating a basic beat with me, and I'm going to play faster. Well, they follow. Wow, they're following. Well, he initiates what? He initiates a, temp, uh, a symbol hit. So what just happened there? We have joint attention, shared attention, shifting attention, problem solving, because they changed their play based, based in music. Um, not to mention all of the sensory input that's happening at the same time that they're integrating, which is sometimes challenging for, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna put them in a, put the kids with autism in a, no. I don't want to say all kids with autism have this, but it is a, 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 a usual component, is the, is the challenges in integrating all the sensory stimuli and motor planning at the same time, which is really, really hard sometimes for them. We take these things for granted because we can do it in a snap, but for, the, but for, but for, for them, it can be really difficult. So the whole thing with that is to get them and, and engage them in whatever type of music experience, and all of these Conventional domain areas, cognition, communication, etc., are all being activated in a temporal way. So the therapist in there, in his or her toolbox, has four main methods. Methods are really different types of experiences that we would offer the, uh, the participant. So improvisations where the client and the therapist are simultaneously making music together. Um, <clears throat> this is where um, the job of the therapist is to organize maybe the, the sounds that are happening with the client and to try to make it more meaningful. Uh, songwriting is when you're composing a song with a client. This could be a window into their emotional world, potentially. Right? Uh, receptive, you probably see a lot of this in hospitals where they're using music with, uh, with guided imagery and pain management. Do, uh, I know some therapists that uh, use receptive. So receptive, the, the client's not actually making music, but is actively listening. And they might use this in, a, in an operating room, per se, maybe. I think one of the most obvious uh, cases of that is, uh, which is getting a lot of traction right now, is music therapy in NICU. Because the baby's not going to play music, um, but they are experiencing different challenges, which is keeping them aw right away from getting out of, out of, out of the hospital. Um, but what they've been sh seeing in research is uh, the way that the music therapist plays, which is usually through improvisation, not a whole song, it's too much sensory stimuli to take in for a, a baby that's having uh, some needs. Uh, they'll find that just using a simple amount of music is actually beneficial towards oxygen saturation and things like that, and lowering heart rate uh, to a more appropriate place. And it's actually helping babies get out of the NICU quicker. And finally, recreating is using a pre-composed song with clients. So say, say maybe you're working with folks that need more structure, and they want to work into, you know, we might, we might start off our, our musical relationship with familiarity, predictability. So it helps them feel safer. But eventually, we want to venture off and, 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 and bring the work a little bit more uh, in depth, so to speak. So these are basically the four methods and, um, that we use. 
And we tend to stay with, not necessarily only in one, but our, our main sort of way of playing with clients at the Rebecca Center is through improvising music, so improvisational music therapy. And that's gonna look different every day. We are very much uh, following a developmental approach towards how we're playing with people and how we're engaging kids. So we're trying to first make sure that they are regulated. So we may play music that um, kind of reflects a little bit about their emotional state or their regulative state and see if that's a way that they can start to connect to it and then join you. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. And we were, we're gonna look at some video too also. Uh, that's sure. how that works. So this is one of the four models and primarily this is what we use because I feel that when working with folks with autism, this kind of lends itself to the way we communicate in the world, right? To spontaneously communicate, not to communicate through rote. Um, when, what's great about live music is that the kids that we work with, well, not just we work, but I think autism um, folks have, have great memory skills, especially auditory memory. So they can memorize patterns very easily and they can repeat those patterns. And I've seen this where I can just leave the room, they're still playing. So where's the interaction? But because it's live and I'm trying to tune into the child's world, I can change the music. I can shift the music. Now what are they going to do? Are they going to change or shift with me? Will they melt down? Maybe they don't know what to do. Maybe they take the idea and take it further. So it's spontaneous back and forth. The idea is to get it robust where it's, 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 it's lasting longer than just four beats or four seconds. There are some kids that we see that have never been in a relationship for more than five seconds at a time. They'll be in it for five seconds, and then something happens, and then they leave. And we have to try to bring them back and try to expand that engagement if we can. How it looks is that we have a variety of uh, percussive, either pitched or unpitched instruments in the room that require no skill on the part of the client. So you don't need musical skill on the part of the client, the client to play. He or she will come into the room and look at this drum. And it's like, what is this big white thing with silver? How do they know that when you hit this, it actually makes a sound, and then this guy here with a big wooden box of black and white things is going to play, <laughs> and then it talks. We know this because this is what we know. But folks who have a hard time with abstraction and symbol may not understand that this, this thing, you hit it, and then Mike's going to play something alongside of me. They might be interested, what? Oh, it's so shiny. Oh, I want to play. And it becomes about the mechanics because it's hard for them to maybe create an idea. Right? So they can come into this, and if they just hit, do this, see? Yeah. Ah. If they do that, it's our job to right away come up with some type of music, either vocally or guitar or through, on piano, to try to enhance it and match it. That beating has got to be the greatest thing in the world. So we can take this perseverative thing like this, where they just, well, and maybe the child's doing this because he just likes the sensory input. And he's not even looking at me. But I can create music for this. La 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 So now it becomes relational. It becomes communicative. Right? So whatever they do, if he's flapping, comes into the room like this. Okay, so I might pick up on the rhythm, see how he's walking into the room. The music has to be informed by whatever he or she is doing. It's not gonna go into like happy music or he's having a bad day today, let's, let's sing a happy song. No, we want to acknowledge that he's having a bad day today. So maybe the music will reflect that. We want to show, hey, I'm here with you. I'm listening to you. And when you stop the mute, the train's not going to go until you jump, until you come back on it. That's the beauty of live music. You can't do that with recorded music. All right? And so now we, we think of all these clinical things that I just mentioned. But now let's think of the aesthetic, you know, the creativity. We're looking at this child as another musician. And that musician is going to inspire me to do whatever I'm doing on the keyboard. I'm not coming up here with, uh, I try not to respond with generic stock responses. We want to try to respond with real genuine empathy. So that the music might not sound good to us, but that's not what aesthetic is about. Beauty in music <coughs> is different for everyone, right? The way we look at aesthetic is the depth of the, of the relational experiences. How, how, how deep is this? is this child in music with me. And we would know some kids, a lot of kids come in initially and the music is one dimensional. The, 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 the composition needs to be a certain way for them to engage. Other, it might, for some kids, they have to be, it has to be fast and loud. So we'll start with fast and loud, but it might sound like, oh, it's a cacophony of sounds. 
But the goal would be, a music goal would be, can he play through a range of tempo and dynamic? Can he uh, expand his range of vocal play? If maybe he's just singing, ah, 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 it might seem uh, monotonous or just not meaningful. We hear music for it. And so that's how we organize the sounds. And that's, that's why we think improvisation can be really effective because they have to respond to something they don't know, you know? <clears throat> Every response is meaningful. And also, like, when we, when, when we bring kids into the center for the first time, they have an intake session, and uh, if the technology gods let us work our magic, <laughs> then we can, we can actually have the parents watch live. Which is not as much as we like it to be, but um, we don't go to church enough. <laughs> uh, um, and, if, and when they get to watch live, they're actually watching somebody, a uh, music therapist, address their child to what seems to be repetitive, and to some people, it could be obnoxious or embarrassing when they're out in public behavior. That seems to be like, no, we don't want that. That's not included in society. However, we have a window into their world and say, no, we can play with that. That can expand their way of interacting with people. So they're getting a firsthand look at what it means, I think, for just uh, a different level of respect. So when we get to actually just make music based off of something that they that find meaningful, or something that they need for their own sensory preferences, it, it opens up a, just a different world. And based on what Mike was saying, just to give you a little idea of how it works when parents do come in, a lot of times they don't know what music therapy is, but they're afraid to ask the question, or they don't know what questions to ask, which makes a lot of sense. We have to do a better job of educating. And so that's why the, 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 the real the, the system, when it works, it's really helpful because we would prefer that parents aren't in the room, but if they need to be there, because sometimes a child needs them to be there, or sometimes the parent wants to be in that. That's fine. We try to we try to make it interactive. They're just not watching. But generally, most of the time, they go into this uh, room, and we'll have one of us sit with them as the therapist is running the eval. This way, the person that's sitting with mom and or dad can explain, because it looks like fun. Oh, this is great. But what's happening clinically? And so we can break it down the way the, the type of assessment we use with the kids. Although it uses musical jargon. It does operationally define each area in a way that any anyone can understand. And that's been really important. Um, so they're breaking it down for mom and or dad there while it's happening live. Oh, this is why Mike, you see how Mike spit up the music there? And look how Johnny like covered his ears. But look, Mike now just started to play low and now he's offering his hand. That's a way where he's trying to foster back and forth with him right now. Because mom might not know, you know, they don't, some parents are like, you're really improvising? You're making that up? <laughs> they don't, because every music's not their thing. Is that a song? You right. Know? Is that a song sure. for you? Sure, made it up. Right. Exactly. And so it's been really helpful. And helpful for us, because then we get the little window into the parents' lens to see, oh, well, we have to do a better job in explaining it this way. <clears throat> there is a learning curve, but I think that they come to really appreciate it, too, though. We have parents that there's a lot of longevity in terms of how long they've been sticking around with us. And every day is something new, which is pretty also amazing about improvisational music therapy. We get to explore a lot of uncharted territory all the time. Yes. So, uh, okay. <clears throat> so remember going back earlier before we talked about the different approaches, you know, behavioral developmental, naturalistic behavioral developmental. So we have taken these techniques and kind of musicified them, if you will. I published an assessment uh, model uh, back in 2013 that we just finished testing at the center. And this is just, you know, an abridged version of what the therapist is doing. So even though we're talking in music, this can be done, we explain this to parents, in, in any type of form, any type of media, it doesn't have to be music, right? Meeting the child's affect. <coughs> Once we join that world, we're trying to get this two-way back and forth. So it's not just me always opening up a circle of communication. If I uh, if I walk into the room and I go, how's everyone doing? How's hello everyone? Hello. Hi. So see, she closed the circle, but no one really was following until she gave permission. <laughs> and I, so I opened the circle. I said, "Hi everyone," and then whoever said "Hi," now that person closed the circle of communication. So let's do it again. <laughs> Hi everyone. Hi. Hi. How are you? She just opened it, so she initiated now another circle. I'm okay, but you know, my throat's bothering me, my neck is hurting, <laughs> you know, the technology. So I, she opens a circle 
I didn't close it. I'm expanding now the play, uh, the, the play with words right now. And now, so I didn't just give a one word answer. Now, can she comprehend this? And what would she say? Because a lot of times we have the kids that come in and they go, hey, Johnny, how you doing? Okay. And they walk away. And I say, aren't you going to ask me how I'm doing? <laughs> but that's very abstract. But we still offer that because that's, that's how you communicate in the world. So that's what two-way musical play is. In music, it's one of, the, one of the few, if not only, media where two people can talk at the same time and it's still communicative. So we can play simultaneously, like jamming, and we, we all have videos we'll show you. Or we can play in a, in a, in a more turn-taking way. You know, if I go, uh, um, uh, you know, la, 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 la. How did you know that I, I wanted that melodic rhythm? Right, right. I did this, but you could have just said la. I said la, 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 and then you all, here, over here, this is really yeah. interactive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they went la, 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 but why didn't you just do la? Uh, if I go la, 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 and then you would go, why didn't you do la? Why didn't you do la, la, la? Why did you repeat it? The tone at the end. What did you the tone at the end? The way that you, like, it was almost like you were waiting for the echo. Okay, yes. So, right, that's one thing. What else? Because you clapped with your hand as if you're counting for us. Yep, mm -hmm. that's right. That's another thing. What else? You had, you had a look of expectation on your face. Yep, mm -hmm. right? All these pre-verbal things mm -hmm. that are going on. But what you picked up is more sophisticated. I'm modeling for you. So you understand modeling and imitation. These are things you cannot learn language if you don't have these things. You can't communicate if you can't imitate. But what we look at it is that. We're like, wow, they understand musical systems. Because the way, to, if you think of it musically, I left enough space at the end of the, you knew it intuitively, but you probably couldn't, if you're not a musician, you might know to break it down. But because I believe we're all musical beings, <laughs> the amount of space in the measure. So it's two, three, four, la, la, la. Three, four, la, la, la. Right. You knew there were two beats that belonged to you. And then you played the melodic rhythm back. Right? So that would be uh, turn-taking. But in turn-taking, we have imitation. Uh, we have all this cognition and pre-verbal things. The pre-verbal stuff, we find a lot of kids have a hard time because they kind of glossed over that stage. That, that involves, you know, gestures and knowing the... Uh, when someone's asking something from you, or you know, uh, sadness when I look at your face. Right? Some of those kids, oh, our kids can't do that. I think a big reason probably behind that is because what is generally taught when you get into the school system is now a lot of the stuff that we prefaced about before, that we're learning a lot of rote language, which tends to be extremely hard to now integrate into your everyday communication and relationships with people, to actually use it functionally or to use it just through a prompt and to get just some sort of reward-based thing out of it? Is, or is it going to be actually uh, fueled into the, the way that you're relating with people? So we are working at a lot of pre-verbal areas, especially with the non, I mean, if it's, if it's with language or not, we're using a lot of gestures. Music uses a lot of symbols so that there's a lot of back and forth communication. So those circles of communication that we were talking about, we want that all the time and so much of it. And so if we're doing this in a relational context, like I just did the la 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 with you, um, we want to keep doing that because we're hitting some neural pathways that might be new. We, it shows that the child can really do it. We might not be providing the experience in the right way, right? And so that's where generalization potentially could come in because we're looking at those foundational capacities, not so much the isolated behaviors. But the, all those things that you just told me, those are the foundational capacities that allow you to be able to understand that message in the la, la, la. So then... Here, if, if, the, if we, we, we follow the child's lead and we, we can join their world, now we try to expand the play where it's a nice back and forth reciprocity. We have some nice joint attention. And this is the hardest place to go, is if we have this nice dance between, it could be actual dancing, or <laughs> it, this nice ebb and flow where the music is flowing and you're getting initiation and you're getting um, creative ideas and abstraction going between you and the child. And this is, we don't see a lot of this. But this is where the therapist tries to go. And if we lose the child, we go back. Oh, we lost him. He's wandering around the room. We have to follow their lead. How do we get into their world again? Also, just to piggyback on that before we go into some video, I think the reason that we see a lot of, like, why is that happening? 
uh, is the exact reason that we're, what we're respecting about the approach. Uh, there's some, it's not finely tuned in the, uh, in the attention area. It's not completely there or the regulation area. So we want, we, that's why our music tends to be kind of cyclical. We can go back and then start the interaction over again. So there might be some holes or just some, some areas that need a little bit more work in the foundational areas of how they can attend and be with people. So it's, now we have some video. Right? We have video. Uh, can you minimize it? It's here, right? Where's the folder that you download? Oh, I got it. I got it. Cool. So we want to show this in a few different case examples. Um, exactly all the things that we're talking about. So uh, I'll show two videos. We might take a little bit of a, you know, a, a talking discussion in between the two, uh, but it happens to be the same uh, boy. Um, this is the first video that he, uh, his first time at music therapy. So it was this intake video. And you could see all the different things that the music therapist is trying to do to uh, elicit engagement and, and foster engagement with uh, and communication with this young boy. So on the piano is Suzanne Sorrell, she's in the music department, and Gabrielle at the time was an intern, I think, or a trainee. So Susie on the piano is hearing the, the tones and trying to meet it musically and leave space for him. She picks up on his movements. That video always gets me like we're in the field. <laughs> I can't hide it. Um, so some, I just think there's just some really beautiful things happening in that in that session. Just get back on track. So um, how do we know that? that I, I have another one, but um, how do we know that he's with her and with them in his playing? 
kind of rock into the base. Mm -hmm. it definitely the way he moves. And for some, uh, I, I know him. His name is Jason. He's been at the center for a few years now, probably about seven or eight. And this was his first session. His first session ever. <clears throat> and this is something that he needs to do to regulate his body is the moving. But if you notice, there was also a change, which I thought was a masterful change from Susie on the piano. She, at first she was playing in like a little bit more of like a, almost like a Middle Eastern mode. It was, it was almost like a little provoking, like we want you to come and play. It was like maybe a little bit too playful for him. So what she did, I thought was just a great, beautiful change into that, um, in just like very lush type of music. And now he's a little bit more situated. He's a little bit more grounded and his swang becomes related. So now he's using his own way of being in the world, being regulated as a communi communicative way of, of dance, really. He's being with, with, with them. And then they left a lot of space, too. So uh, <coughs> it just happens to be an improvisational technique that we might be playing music. And then to check in with the client, we may stop to see what their response is. And he fills in with his own breathing. And I, I, I view that as singing. So. The, 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 well, the tones he was expressing yeah, yeah, were tonal. Yeah, very tonal. Yeah. She would lead, she would lead that leading tone, and then he would resolve it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, the last one he does the fi yeah. he does the, it's called a, fi a cadence. He did the cadence because he breathed, he breathed up and then and then he to the tonic. But and, then, down. and then and then he came, he came down. He, it was also a symbol that it was over. Their interaction was right. over. That's right. And that's like huge, especially because he's 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 a at this point a young man who has yet to develop language. No language skills up to this point. So let's jump ahead a few years, and uh, this is a music therapy session with him, uh, I believe now at 15 years old. And we could just we could just see him, uh, he's a little bit bigger. I can't, I'm just okay. So I'm gonna cue it up and show you just a little bit of interaction to see where he's come with his music in about seven years. <clears throat> <laughs> Just a little bit of a glimpse of where he's at. <laughs> and uh, in this, when I show this video, it's hard to, he's so, I feel like he's so present, he's so very in the moment, and very flexible with the way that he makes music with me. It's kind of hard to tell for me in that moment exactly who kind of starts to get faster and who starts to kind of push the tempo. And even in that moment when we start to like kind of like really get into like a really big beat, I couldn't necessarily tell even going back how it happened, but it was just very, he was very flexible and spontaneous in the moment in, in his communication with me. So again, a boy who just doesn't necessarily have language is using a lot of pre-verbal skills of gesture and play to be with me in a very robust and uh, just great experience. If you think about these social emotional things that are going on too, I mean, you could some might say, well, he can't stay focused because he's playing three different instruments, but that's not true because he kept his eyes right on Mike yeah. the whole time. Mm -hmm. I think he was creating stuff. Yeah. And at the point, and I don't know because I don't really know him that well, but. When Mike started playing real fast and you held that one chord really for a long time, I think maybe you were trying to get him to play the tremolo. Mm -hmm. Physically, motorically, I don't think he could do it, but what did he do? He went to the piano because he knew he could do it. He could play that fast on the piano. I mean, we think. There's a lot of problem solving and then initiating tempo changes and dynamic changes. But any note that he plays, Mike will make it fit. That's the thing. So that's where we're following his lead. But then you were clearly creating these... Uh, these places for him to, to, to expand the play. Okay. And so these are this is kind of the things of what kind of guides our music making. So this comes from a, a developmental relationship-based model. We didn't invent it, we just use it. 
It's called the DIR model. D's for development, I's for individual differences, R is relationship based. So we want to understand where the child is developmentally. We don't want to work over that, or we don't want to, want to work below that. It doesn't matter how old they are chronologically, we want to know where they are developmentally. The I is really what are the things that are getting in his or her way in getting up that developmental ladder. So it could be the sensory things that I mentioned before. Um, it could also be receptive or expressive language skills. It could be motor planning, uh, emotional modulation, all of these things that may be interfering with his ability to move up this developmental ladder. So we want to provide the sensory diet for them, whatever that might be. There are times where you know I'm just giving deep pressure to a kid's leg because it helps regulate him. And now we can engage in music because the goal again is to engage him in music. Not to do any, not to get him to do anything but that. So if we say, wow, if I do this, he seems to be with me. Right? The R is really, it should be R D I, but <laughs> everything we do is in the context of relationship. We want to understand what is his or her mode of relating. You know, how they how do they, they relate to mom, dad, caregiver, and to us. And so everything is kind of framed and guided through here. Six FE, that's functional emotional developmental levels, right? And so, so it, uh, we use this as a guide. So from ages zero to three months, a child, a typical developing child should be able to take the sights and sounds in of the world while being engaged with mom, dad, or whomever. Then level two, a little bit above that, is their ability to engage. And then it keeps going all the way up to more sophisticated play, four years old, where they're able to create ideas and bridge ideas, engage in gray area thinking. That's kind of a, where pretend play comes into play. Pretend play comes into play. <laughs> pretend play does come into play at that. Right before that, we'll see parallel play. They both are playing. They know each other. I know you're there, but I'm not really playing with you. When we get to levels five and six, which is creating ideas, now there's a nice ebb and flow of back and forth of idea exchanges. Right. And, and for me personally, like learning a, a little bit about like you know, development and that you can uh, subscribe to this way of understanding development for autism, it was almost a little weird to understand that like, so I'm working with like a 15 year old, but he doesn't necessarily have all of the skills that maybe a zero to three month year old should have. It Well, there's uh, like we were saying before, there might be pockets. So like he, he may be able to attend for a certain period of time where he may be able to engage with you, but then there's something that the environment has maybe provided that is not necessarily uh, suiting them right now, so and they have a hard time regulating. So it's just something for us to be aware of in terms of how they're interacting with their environment, but there's still a, a few places in their development that is not completely mastered, and which needs we just have to have in mind. Or they can show capacities when the conditions are just right. right. And then when you change it, they might come off. So we have to figure out how do we, how do we help them develop a range of emotion within these different capacities. <clears throat> So as he's setting this up, his work was when you'll see Mike, this Mike, because the, 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 the teenager's name is Mike also, who was an intern at the time, and I'm on the piano. And he's like, what, 17 in this video maybe, right? And so uh, he, he, um, he's very much into rope. Even when he talks, it's very monotone. Hi, how are you? but he doesn't know how to come back with when you answer it. He'd always come in with knock-knock jokes, but the same ones every week. <laughs> and, but it was just a script. It was just a script. Knock-knock. Uh, and I go, who's there? He goes, Tuba. I go, Tuba what? He goes, Tuba Toothpaste. And I go, nah. And I just try to get a response from him, but it'd be the same. He'd just walk away. So what I, did, what I started doing was he'd go, knock-knock. And I go, I know. Tuba Toothpaste, right? And then he wouldn't know how to, to respond, and he would walk away. But just because he can't do it, I still want to put him in that position, even though it could be anxiety-provoking. So here, he, this is one of our first <laughs> sessions together, I think. And uh, the clock is, you'll see, he's looking at the clock, but it's off camera. It's off to the, the, to the door, and he knows the session ends at 4.30 or something, right? Three, three. Or whatever it was. Yeah. So he's just perseverating on the clock. And just starts hitting in a ro banging the drum in a robotic way, anxiously. Anxiously, and you could see. Well, you'll see as the session goes on, as the clip goes on, how his body starts to regulate itself. He starts. To, he seems to be anyway getting uh, more regulated. But as he's 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 repeating the clock, 19 more minutes till music, 18 more minutes. Seven, and I'm like, oh boy, we got to do something. So here's an example <laughs> where the music joins this, and then I do some playful obstruction. You know, I kind of mix it up for him. 
and then tr try, even if he gets upset, he's still now in an interaction as opposed to being isolated and counting the minutes down at the clock. And so the music then is fluctuating. Once he has the basic beat, I change it again. Once he's there, so it's rupture and repair. Oh, it's rupture and repair. <clears throat> Twenty more minutes. <laughs> okay. So he's not really with me. Now he's with me. <laughs> oh, he has a symbol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you see now the wrist action is the more loose, so he seems getting more regulated. Four o'clock is coming soon. <laughs> Now we have more ultimate beating. It's physically more invested in the play. Mm -hmm. Look at his feet. Right, right. My, his feet are still there. Look at his feet. I was trying to get him to do what I got you guys to do, but he wasn't having it. There he is. <laughs> he repeated the lyric, but I was trying to get him to do it rhythmically. <laughs> but it's just the music follows him, but then tries does something where he's going to hopefully come with us. Even when he said four o'clock is coming soon, so I got to figure out the amount of syllables so I could put it into this tune. <laughs> so four o'clock is coming soon, and then the whole thing with the Michael, Mike, and John, he had to keep correcting himself. But he, he did it. It shows that he was with me in the interaction. Um, yeah, so this clip... This is her first session, Layla. And Jill's the co-therapist. Every time we do an, uh, an eval or an assessment, we usually have two folks in the room, either a therapist and an intern or two therapists. Uh, as you see, one on the one is primarily responsible for the music making, and the other is there to facilitate on the floor if needed. So when Layla came to us, um, we don't look at the enrollment information. We don't want to know the diagnosis or anything, because I think that we go in there with these ideas that because we think music is a different place for them to unfold. And so, I don't know if you remember, but when she first comes, she sits in this chair and she's just leaning over the chair. So it looked like her core did not exist. And I'm trying to get her to play, and I put the tambour, nothing. I'm like, oh, okay, she seems to be impaired. You know, okay, let's see if she can follow, you know, 
pointing and things like that. So we have the, the snare drum, that's like what he was playing, and the cymbal in the middle of the room. So I said, do you want to play that? Why don't you play that? And she gets up and she sits behind the, the chair and she the sticks were already there. And she takes the sticks and she's just kind of like doing like this and kind of wakes up and the music plays, so to speak. And this is where the video takes place. So the music that I'm playing is trying to find this and to bring it out until she starts playing. <laughs> so the music changes because she memorized that now we change it and I take away the visual support where so first she couples it with me doing the affect and now she's able to integrate it but the phrase is calling out for it So the, the phrase kept going, she stopped off playing the symbol. Cross this line for a beat. <laughs> So I wanted to end there, but she kept playing, so <laughs> 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 so the whole thing with me doing we use a lot of affect whether it's body affect vocal play singing you know in falsetto or grunting or whatever it is but we believe that the core one of the core features of what i think the main with autism is is disconnect between affect and sensory motor and we want to provide them with these affective experiences so whether it's through singing or my body. The body thing was that once she used to symbol, I'm going to play, but I also want to do this. And she liked that. She smiles. I did it again. And then I took it away, and she was able to integrate the sounds, and the music was starting to develop more. And while all this is going on, she's still like referencing Jill, and she references me, and the drum. All of this, this triangulation thing that was going on, right? And the music, I initiated the speed up, and then she starts playing. Close. And you saw she crossed midline once, yeah. which for kids um, like Layla could be really difficult. But if you can't cross midline, you, you'll never be able to read. But this is, we're not trying to fix midline. She just happened to do it. I don't know where it came from. She just invented it. She did it once, you know? Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you see kids trying to do that, it's almost like when you take two batteries, two positives, mm -hmm. and they just can't, mm -hmm. they can't do it. There's just this lack of body awareness, I guess. I think what's really solid about this video is the engagement, but also intention. Because I think at one point, it got so fast, and this kind of reminds me of what you said about Jason, it got so fast that she was trying to keep up, right. but I don't, I don't think she could physically. Right. Um, but you could see the intent was there, so she was trying to stay with you and trying to connect. Yes. Right. And the other thing, that, oh, I'm sorry, that there was a joy piece in there that you could see where, as you said, where she was engaged with you. You know, and it wasn't, I mean, it may have been there in the other videos, but it was so visible on her face right. that, you know, she was participating and she was getting something that was very important out of that 
you know, iterative, reiterative kind of experience that, I mean, it just seemed, it was so, you know, out there that you could see. And um, that's very important in being able to stay connected. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, we, we look for the gleam in the eye. That's, mm -hmm. that, that's yeah. the thing. Yeah, that's right. At the very end, she played a joke on me. Yeah. <laughs> I ended, right? yeah, we didn't know. We didn't know when she first walked in. It just seemed like she was more impaired. And and if we treated her like that, we wouldn't have gotten this nice stuff. Yeah. Um, I like the information that you brought up about the transitioning from behavioral therapist to developmental. Because um, my son, he's going to be 14 and on Monday. He's autistic. And all throughout our lives, he's always he had early intervention and everything, but he's always had a behavior therapist. And um, he's broken about four drums at home and the piano and stuff. But now he's into teaching himself how to play the guitar. And he taught himself through YouTube. And it was one of the behavior therapists that came to the house and said, you know, he is so um, acclimated that you should give him something he wants. So he started learning how to play the guitar on his own, and it is phenomenal how he could just hear the wow. tones and transition it on his guitar to the point now he's singing at church, and um, <clears throat> he's not on task with everyone, but no one, like, ridicules him for it. Like, they know what he's about, and it's just amazing when he starts singing. So, you know, it, it, I like this whole developmental um, segue, and I think it's something that it definitely needs to be explored further. And I'm thinking at 14, what am I going to get him for a birthday gift on Monday? <laughs> Ten oh, sessions in Rebecca Center. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I see that may be a good experience. Thanks for sharing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I find it amazing how you are able to put your expectations aside. And let things evolve. Sometimes, but we try. That's that, 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 that's that's yeah. That's important. Well, I, I think in general about being a therapist or a healthcare provider is putting expectations yeah. aside a bit. It's not easy because we have wants and desires too for our clients, right? And some of our selfish need can get in the way. But uh, that's why we have uh, training and supervision and all that good stuff. But sometimes I think in a good, healthy way, our expectations of the client. Uh, whoever we're working with is great for what we expect of them to make progress in, as long as we're feeling that it's 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 in the benefit of them and not necessarily us. Right, which takes a lot of self inquiry. Mm -hmm. The counter-transference is always alive and kicking in that context. Yeah. I have I have a question. Yeah. Do you ever have parents who have higher expectations than what the child could do? Yeah. <laughs> but we also have parents that have lower expectations than their child can do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, so, so how do you reconcile that? Well, one of the things, we, 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 for the videos, we make videos and we do progress meetings, progress report meetings with parents. And this is where we can talk to them. Because a lot of times we're always buzzing, so it's hard to meet with the parents after the session. But we don't want to talk in front of other people uh, with them. So. Well, you can speak more of this, you know, because they're more active in parent meetings than I am these days. Yeah, and it, it gets, sure. it can get kind of emotional, yeah. you know, so we're, we're ready to hear all those things out and understand what the parent is going through, because at the center, yeah, we don't have a lot of time to necessarily talk after the session, but we try to find a nook or, or somewhere where we can go talk for a little bit, especially if it was a, a session that we found extremely meaningful that we should be talking about. Um, but we work very much with the family, and it's a good segue into the program slide, but we, we're very much about how we can offer <coughs> services to everybody involved, and even us talking to them every week is, I think it's, I think it's uh, there's meaning behind that, it's beneficial for them to know. Also, because we're, we're, we're giving them probably a, a bit of a different insight than what they're hearing from school every day. We're, I think we're just looking at different things, and we're valuing different, different things sometimes. Not all the time, I won't, I won't say school doesn't do that. Um, but we, we just have a different approach, a different method, and I think for, for a lot of the times, for, for the parents that have too much expectation or not enough expectation, it's really the same thing because we are just helping even at the playing field of what is attainable right now and what are we working towards because we are seeing a lot of um, you know, hope towards things and definitely progress towards things. For sure. But we also use that information to try to understand the child better. Maybe that's all. Oh, that's why he might be do, exhibiting this type of behavior, 
one of the things that we take a lot of pride in is that parents, we, we, have, we try to establish just as tight a relationship with them, a therapeutic pleasure, as we do with the kids. And most parents come, they just talk about how much they love be, being here. Mm -hmm. When Sandy had, when Sandy occurred mm -hmm. and parents were displaced, we thought we were, we were involved in a big research study at the same time. And we thought, oh, well, what are we going to do? They can't get here. We, were already, we, we already created this plan. We're going to go to the homes. Where can we meet them? We were on their priority list because it brought normalization to the family. And it's, we just love being here. A lot of us do with Stephanie's in the waiting room, always, you know, talking with them because we don't have that much time with them. It's such a huge part of it uh, is managing. I don't want to say managing because it's like manipulative, but managing the relationships, you know, with the families. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, we saw the progress with Jason over the years in terms of in the music therapy session. Do you also get a sense from the parents that there's progress being made outside of the music therapy setting? Sometimes, not with everyone. Because mm -hmm. um, it also depends on what's going on at home. If he's going to behavioral therapy 20 hours a week and we see him for 30 minutes mm -hmm. a week, it's really difficult. It's really, yeah. I was just going to say that, I mean, the, you know, previously, like the ABA training was very much about creating, you know, uh, a, a, a set of responses, like a response, uh, you know, you do this, you do that, you're reinforced for it. And, you know, you see what you hear from adults is that, um, you know, the kids can function in the world of adults because adults will tolerate, hey, you know, right. welcome, hello, how are you, or saying, you're, you know what to do when your client comes in and is saying the same knock-knock joke each day. Right. But the challenge, you know, with ABA therapy and behavioral therapy is always more about the peer group mm -hmm. because, you know, the peer group is not able to be flexible in that way. You know, they have their expectations that kids will behave the way kids of that age or that level of development will behave. And so I think what you're talking about here is it's a really different model for doing that. And school-based therapy is also very much focused on learning the behaviors that are required to comply in the school setting. Mm -hmm. There's a set of expectations around school behaviors. <laughs> Sit quietly, don't be disruptive, pay attention to your seat work. And so some of the school-based therapy is kind of oriented to helping you to be successful in that kind of less flexible environment. Right. Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. One of our visions, <laughs> or part of the mission, is to get kids to learn differently. Not just kids with autism, all kids. Okay. And uh, we have school districts that bus kids in. We're going to talk about that pretty soon. And also get back to your question, because we're going to get into research, hopefully, just very briefly. Um, how do we know that this works or does it work? Is, is, do we see changes? We do get some anecdotal things where uh, parents are coming when they see the video crying. I've never seen him like this before. It's translating. You've gotten more speech out of him than the speech therapist. Is, uh, that doesn't always happen. Then there are some parents that just like the, they don't look at it as a therapy. They just like it that he enjoys it. Then there are some parents, this is respite for them. They have 30 minutes or maybe 40 minutes, but they can chill out. And I, I get it. You know, I got two little kids, you know, I just, you know, I, just, I can't imagine what that must be like, you know, and so we understand that's fine. We just do our job and we, we talk to them in a, in a clinical way, but we also want to talk to them in a way that they'll understand. And uh, whatever works for them, that's because they're the parents. Um, so, yeah. Well, one of the things I learned early on as a, as a parent of an autistic child is to learn to live in their world, not mm -hmm. wanting them to live in my world. Mm -hmm. And one of the books that I was encouraged to read was The Out of Sync Child by Carol Car Karowitz or something. And that was Carowitz. a real, yeah, mm -hmm. Karowitz. And that was a really good um, starting point for me. But as he gets older and older and the hormones are coming into play, it's like, hmm. You know, how do I define what his world is? Because he doesn't verbalize that much. And when he does, it's very short, <coughs> short words. So it, that covers them. So the music, he says a lot in his music when he plays. And I can comprehend that because I'm musically inclined as well. So, you know, but his siblings can't. So it's difficult for them. So it, it's not bad. There um, is empirical studies that show that kids, uh, folks with autism, do understand musical systems mm -hmm. and uh, more than actually more than typical neurotypical folks uh, as a way to justify doing this 
um, for whatever reason. You know, I don't really know. I have some hypothesis, but I don't need to prove. What type of music do you play in the NICU for the babies? I'm a maternal child nurse. So is it like Beethoven? Or huh. That's what people or think, that Mozart effect was a hoax. We don't work in the NICU. I just, I just made like a little comment on it based on okay. like what that might look like, because music therapy really is everywhere nowadays. Yeah. I think Beethoven is beautiful. Uh, I love it. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it could be overwhelming. For yeah. a child traveling in the NICU, there's Something. way too much going on. It's open is actually like way stacked. Like it's like it's super overly uh, dramatic. Uh, it would be it would be too much. I literally, what I think from what I've seen of you know some of these presentations is that you know, they'll they'll focus more on very simple ways of of playing music to help regulate, but consistent and repetitive ways of playing music, and usually just through voice. Mm -hmm. And sometimes. Um, if they work in this way, because this isn't just for autism. This is the way. This is the way we be. This is how we be. With, with I mean, I live like this, mm -hmm. and I, I was I, I I was trained by the founder of the DIR model. I I got paid for it. It was unbelievable. <laughs> so you realize that intuitively, well, I always lived this way, and this just kind of filled the gaps in the theory. Um, so folks in the NICU that work this way, I have some colleagues. They will also improvise, but they'll like take the sounds of the machines, the breathing of the child, even the breathing of mom, if mom is in there. Because the idea is then to show mom what you're doing and they can take these strategies at home. So maybe the music is, is, is based on how the breathing is happening. It could be a lullaby. It could be a simple, like you said, maybe no harmonic instruments, just voice. Um, because that the, the baby, I guess, would be mostly in tune with mom's voice as well. And there's studies on that. On a train, kind of entrainment type things, you know, ISO principle. Right. And I think one of the cool generalizable things is that they're, we're, we're giving, and we try to do this too when we are meeting with parents, we give them techniques that we often use in our clinical practice. Because they see this way that, they, that, 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 wow, they're able to engage for longer than a few seconds, or they're more interested in this kind of thing. What can I do at home to help supplement that kind of thing? I want to engage like that. So even at the hospital, they'll do things where, uh, they'll put, you know, to put the baby on the mom's chest and they'll, they'll kind of coach the mom on how to sing with the baby so that it helps the baby be more regulated with mom. Well, we're open to research. Maybe we can know that going. Yeah. 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 Two willing students that are real, with, yeah. with car and guitar, we'll travel. <laughs> <laughs> so what we saw in, in a lot of the videos, actually all the videos, was individual music therapy sessions, which tends to probably take up a, a, a good chunk of what we do at the center. Although we do try to move them into a peer-focused uh, group, which tends to be rather small, so that we can still focus on the individual differences of everybody, and that no one's getting kind of left out. So we it really probably between two and three, sometimes four members uh, in, in our in our group music therapy sessions. Um, but with school districts, um, we were finding that there's an increasing need on Long Island, definitely that not enough special education. Uh, <coughs> programs are funding or have music therapists. So a lot of them have come to us. We have, I think, three or really four-ish kind of knocking on the door. We have three that are in um, that are busing kids in. We just, right before I started this, I was just doing that. Uh, there was there was a, a, a high school group that comes in, there's middle school, and now we have elementary school kids that are getting bussed in every week in their classrooms going into the session room and now this is just a different way for them to how to how to learn and interact and negotiate and problem solve, make music with each other. The busing costs more than the program. It just shows you how invested they are. And we don't have enough space. We have other districts that want to come to us. And we wish we could accommodate, but but we, we just can't. And they come just for it's right in the smack of the, in the middle of their of their day. And so that says a lot, you know, to the to uh, the, the programs. And here, we have gotten feedback from the teachers and the parents saying that there has been dramatic change in the classroom. And not only the change that the kid is showing, but the way that the parents are interacting with the kids have changed. To me, that's more important. They see it, they see them in a different context, mm -hmm. which is terrific. Um, so in addition to music therapy um, and work with the school districts, we also do DIR floor time. That was based on the model, the developmental model that I talked about earlier. So we do that as well. Uh, we do parent coaching in the context of DIR floor time. We've, uh, we're trying to get this Center for Autism going. You know, we've had some staggering programs. It's just um, resources really to get this going with this. The idea is that it would, be, it would be an interdisciplinary model that would involve all of Malloy's programs. We've done, we're doing stuff with nursing. Uh, 
we're, we're doing stuff with social work. Education is doing a lot of stuff with us. Uh, we're trying to get the, get speech to, uh, to to work with us. It's just difficult with scheduling and resources and whatnot. But this would be this will be would be the one stop shop. So parents just come to one place and everyone's speaking the same language to mom and dad, and it would be uh, a great thing if we can get it going. So we hope that's going to happen. So the education services come from the ed department. We do tutoring here on Monday nights. You have to see how many people come for this. I mean, you, the kid, the parents are outside the, the waiting area. Yeah. Tuesday nights, we're open Monday through Friday, and we're here till seven, eight o'clock at night sometimes. Ed students, they don't even need the hours. They want to be part of the center, and they come. And then on Saturdays, we have a program led by Audra Ceruto. She goes into the Baldwin School Districts with the students, and she's doing the tutoring and whatnot. Um, with uh, that one, it's one school, it's one school district, mm -hmm. right? Baldwin. Baldwin. Her and Ricky Maroney, along with about 25 ed students. So that program, I mean, Audra, she's just amazing. And they're informed by this model, and we're all speaking the same that, language. That's the key, right? And then we, we spoke about our interns, our fabulous interns. If you're <laughs> um, so, yeah. And so we'll quickly get into to research. Um, as I said, we primarily were a clinic site. Uh, about seven, eight years ago, I was invited to join this international uh, group, this study, to do this study. It would be the largest autism study ever, not just in music therapy, but ever. And the plan was to get 400 participants across nine countries, across nine sites, and we were invited to the U.S. site. It was, a, it was just a great privilege. That was the first clinical trial ever done at Mori College, even though the paperwork might have been stated was a while ago, but that was the first clinical trial. Um, so it was about a four million dollar study. The, the 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 PI was head the head of the, the head of the, of the the study was based in University of University of Bergen in Norway, and so we had the United States, Korea, Norway, Brazil, Israel, Israel Australia. There you go. Um, it was the first well controlled study in music therapy, I, I feel, and the largest randomized control trial. I just said that. Mm -hmm. um, so when the study ended, so we wrote the grant probably in 2010. We knew we were getting it in 2011, and we had never done anything like this before. But they, I, they had confidence in me, and I had confidence in our group. Um, so we randomized our first child September of 2012. The study ended in late 17, and we published the results in JAMA. Very proud of that. Um, the, sig the, the significant, uh, the primary outcome did not, the primary outcome we use is ADOS, which is a severity outcome. Not the best outcome to use for autism, but back then we wanted to get the fun. And we, we knew more, you know, the study, the study took seven, eight years, so we learned more as time went on. Not many research studies used ADOS, and the ones that did did not show good outcomes. Journals like JAMA are not concerned with secondary outcome measures, but they had some great feedback. The two is we had, a, we, had a, we had an editorial piece, but so significant. So the the uh, primary measure did not come back with any significant outcomes. Control group and treatment group showed the same. However, our secondary outcome measure, which looks at engagement, social responsiveness, that's where we showed positive outcomes. But again, we couldn't highlight that because that was not our primary outcome. So we had to make a decision in publishing this. Do we want to be in one of the best journals in the world, or take our second? We said let's go for the best journals in the world. Mm -hmm. And so the study got up was very controversial, but I think, you know, I mean, when I spoke to Ronnie about it, she, because we were, we felt so dejected at the time to do this. Well, the and commentary I, after was very positive. Yes. The commentary, the published article, yes. and then the commentary afterward took those things into account. So yeah. that was definitely, I think, important to be able to couple with uh, the, the article itself. I think your smart people understand that. See, I, I get that. <laughs> And it's funny, I had a cardiology appointment like a week after the, the journal came out because when it came out, CNN is calling all these different news things were calling us because it, it got it was a hot topic. So if we would have showed positive on any guys, man. So I go to my cardiologist and he says, John, I didn't know that's what you just what do I do? I said, you know about that study? He says, it just came out. I read it. I said, I forgot, you know, he's, he subscribes. But it just showed folks that weren't really familiar with the disciplines were now being familiar. The other great thing that came out of the study were all the sub-projects. So we've, we we reached out to the Malloy community and saw, hey, are you interested in joining us? And we have all this data. What can we do with this data? The other thing that we did, we took the limitations of the study and started to apply those in new studies. So this study, uh, I just sent it off uh, to an autism journal. 
um, we we're looking at how specific music therapy techniques might work. So uh, an improvisational technique that deals with imitation, how does this maybe promote engagement with kids that are pre-verbals? The only music therapy that's ever studied a technique. Because we can say music therapy works, but how do we know it works? When do you know when to shift amongst techniques? No autism, autism studies actually talk about the sequence of what the therapist does. That's what we want to do. And so we finished this study. We did this with a collaboration with the University of Tennessee with their speech and language department. Um, and then this study is venturing off. This is in progress now. Mike is the PI. In this study, we received grant funding for this. And this is really the same thing, looking at different techniques. But not just the techniques, but what type of response does the kid get, give you? Because we got, because we did obtain engagement in time A, and it wasn't, That's right. you know, it wasn't for nothing. That's right. they, they did obtain a lot of skills. We're looking to see what exactly happened to make that happen. So we're, you know, really scrutinizing with the data and going in and looking very microscopically about every single moment, literally about every four seconds or so. We're understanding what the therapist is doing in that exact moment because you could see there's a lot going on in these tapes. We want to see like what's leading to the best engagement. So that's that's what's happening now. And the codes that we would use, they come from you know um, non-music therapy codes. They come from really engagement in speech and language that was offered by the person at UT. And what was great about both of these, we used student coders. They had their PhD students who were speech and language pathologists uh, codes, so they didn't even know anything about music therapy. So we had high reliability amongst the coders, and it showed that exact imitation with minimally minimally kids who have lower level language skills, <laughs> scored high with imitation. So we had three different conditions, imitation, contingent response, and imitation with elaboration. So since we showed that kids with minimal language skills, verbal skills, uh, did better with imitation, the hypothesis is that maybe kids with better language skills would do better with contingent response. So we'll give a grant over to the Grammy Foundation that hopefully would support that. We'll see what happens. So we try to build on all the studies. Everything is is, is is really much the same. That's where Mike's study coming into play. And this too, we had we had students uh, involved in coding. Um, I told you earlier, I, 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 I published a model, and uh, an assessment model. So it's, it's been used, it's being used worldwide, but I never tested it. Every time I do a training, I always get, well, what are the psychometric properties? So we have to do this. It took three years, but we did. We used the data from time A, uh, the, the, the large randomized trial to get reliability and validity in that. Uh, the reliability portion was published in the Nordic, in the Nordic Journal. We showed almost perfect reliability in all the different measures. And validity is happening now. We have the data. We just now have to write it up. So, just. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I just. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, so Laura Kestenberg from Mental Health Counseling, her thing was parent stress. So we invited her on board and uh, <clears throat> she um, took our, used our data to show relationships between parent, parents' perceptions of their child's social reciprocity and um, parents, how it correlates to parent stress, which makes a lot of sense, but no one really proved it. Right? There were some studies that showed on early, they call it PSI, parent stress index. So there was no study showing that the PSI-4 had these outcomes. Um, this is Jill. Jill's the PI of this study. So I told you we have school districts that come in. So we figured, hey, we want to sustain these programs. We need, we need to show some data that shows that this works. So the teachers are giving you know, behavioral uh, da outcome data to us. We're taking anecdotal things, some qualitative data as well. And then Jill has imported um, um, uh, music therapy um, assessment into the big chime in. I know we have, I'm just going through this and we're going to wrap it up. Um, this, uh, we're, Adia, Adia's right here. So Dee, when she was a student many uh, many years ago, in her, I think it was undergrad, right? Mm -hmm. We did we probably did this for three years. We went through the autism literature like nobody's business, mm -hmm. and we found all the garbage that parents are getting from pediatricians and neurologists, the folks that diagnose. But who will publish that article? That's the problem, mm -hmm. right? We can't. You know, you look at the editorial board and you see their credentials. There's a lot of ABA going on. And so we found a lot of gaps. Stella Mann, who used to work here in the research office, she also, she was the one who brought this to our attention, this little kernel. And then we went in there and just, we were like archaeologists. And Dee was amazing. You know, she spent, oh, forget about the amount of time. We presented this at several conferences. We got a lot of backlash, but we stuck to our company. We have the data. 
you know, we have the data. That's and that, it. And that's what's informed us also today about, you know, telling you all about these different approaches and how that's they're, right. you know, what's in a name, all the semantics that's involved in all of it. That's right. It's, because parents don't know. And even a lot of clinicians don't really go into literature. They don't have time to do that. Right? Um, this, so no one's ever done a study that takes the DIR model and put it into a music therapy context. So I did it for my dissertation. And uh, finally wrote it up in an article form like six years later. And uh, it was published. Uh, there was a lot of limitation because we need a higher subject pool. But I think we had some nice data to then build on this to show that we see something here. It wasn't significant because the, the, the end size was small. And then, and now, we're working with Ronnie and her and team. And the music introduces that. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe you can talk to that. Yeah, um, real briefly, though, one of the things that the reasons I wanted for John and Mike to come over so that we can learn a little background to it, there are so many opportunities for nurses and for our PhD students to get involved uh, with, with these guys, with our interests in parents and children. Uh, pediatric nurses or maternal child nurses. So we're real open to other ideas. I love the NICU idea, and I'm, I don't see anybody here that might, oh, I do know someone who's got a real good NICU background, but, uh, but I definitely want to keep that going. And we are also adding an extension and arm onto that. And Dr. Vitale and, and Maureen Lowers Roach, our my RA, will be um, doing a qualitative, in depth. Uh, um, interviews with parents that we can invite from the original study. Mm -hmm. So that's our hope. Yeah, it's, it's great. And Once there's all, all this, you know, all the screening data, uh, you know, it's becoming uh, possible to screen and identify the mm -hmm. spectrum so much earlier than previously. And there's still only about 80% uptake in primary care. Offices, not 100% screening of 18 and 24 month old children, even though you know the uh, standards have been. So there's other interesting sides mm -hmm. to it, and you know I had shared, and you know I just did a little faculty study, and clinicians are not well informed about strategies to assist families when their children are diagnosed with mm -hmm. developmental disabilities, and that's one of the biggest challenges, and that's what you're talking about, you know that. Um, the, the effective strategies are not widely available. How many places are offering these kinds of That's right. So they don't, they don't know what they don't know. <laughs> and so, yeah. And if anyone has any ideas, you know, to click, it doesn't have to be autism, you know, for your doctoral students, if there are any, I don't know who's a doctoral student or who's not, um, we would be open. This is great. This is the reason why I wanted to be able to do this. And I can't thank you enough for coming and sharing. Oh, thank you. Plus, I'm really proud of being able to work with you guys. So, um, to, to make this move quickly, this is my thank you. And then the only thing that I ever offer is you can go to lunch and I'll take care of that if you want to. But that's all you get. I'm sorry. That's all you get. So, I'm going to end this so that. Um, Talking amongst yourselves if you need to, but thank you everyone for coming. Thanks for coming. Do you find helpful for children on the higher end of the spectrum, such as Asperger's? Yeah, because now with kids' language, they can probably do more language based things like songwriting. Yeah. Or they can bring songs in, we can talk about anything that can be a social thing, we can talk about problems, we can solve. Yeah. But absolutely, yeah.